Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. This episode, we're talking 3D printing, additive manufacturing with an exciting newer company that many of you may not have heard of, Inkbit. We have Andre Comella. He's the, uh, a senior mechanical uh, engineer at uh, Inkbit, and he's joining us today to talk. Now, here in Masters of Engineering, we welcome Andre. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. That was a, um, it was uh, really great to meet you when I visited Inkbit, what, about a year, a year or so ago, and I'm so excited to share what you're doing. Um, th now, tell us about Inkbit. What are you doing there that's so special for the world of 3D printing and additive? Yeah, so, so Inkbit is largely focused on, um, you know, trying to achieve this goal that uh, additive has been after for a while, which is sort of production level uh, 3D printing. Um, so we have a large machine with a large build plate uh, and a lot of ability based on a, a variety of things uh, that allows us to print a large number of parts very quickly. Um, we are an inkjet based technology, uh, which gives us a lot of accuracy. We are using photo cured resins, so it's all UV cured. Um, and we have um, a, a wax as a support base, so we've sort of done away with all of the the messy support removal that you get with uh, SLA or powder-based technologies. Um, mm -hmm. So the process is designed to be fast, it's designed to be low labor um, and high yield for uh, high accuracy parts. Okay, and so so um, I've run into a couple of people, uh, customers of ours actually, not affiliated with Inkbit, who sing your praises. And everything you said is great, but the reason that they're excited are the parts. Yes. that they, they just said to me, have you seen these parts? Why are the people I meet so excited about Inkbit printed parts? Well, I mean, I have a few I could actually show you. So we have, uh, okay. this is one of our sample parts, which is uh, a demonstration of our latticing. So one of the things that mm -hmm. we're able to do that's really hard to do with other technologies is we're able to print lattices, uh, really mm -hmm. fine ones. So these different structures, um, they're gyroids, sometimes they're meshes. Um, that is a really difficult thing either to print or to clean with other technologies. Uh, and we're also able to print really good uh, elastomers, so uh, essentially rubbers, um, which is another thing that a lot of other 3D printing technologies have struggled with. And so being able to combine both of those things has let us do some really impressive parts that I think really wow people. Um, yeah. The elastomers themselves are one of our biggest um, you know, sources of of orders. Uh, people really like them. And the process currently of prototyping anything that's like a rubber or silicone, um, even if you want like a looks like feels like, uh, it's, it's really difficult and usually involves someone uh, getting a mold made and then shooting the mold, uh, which is kind of crazy because that's a, a production level tool that's being used uh, in the prototyping process. So it makes the, the process very slow and very expensive. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we've been able to come in and basically offer people the ability to prototype these things for a tenth of the cost or less. Um, and we are able to print multiple materials simultaneously, uh, which is the other big part of this that um, most other resin technologies, any of these like vat cured resins, so SLA, DLP kind of stuff, uh, they don't, uh, they, they can't print multiple materials. And so the ability mm -hmm. to do that has allowed us to do things like prototype and overmold or you know, make a rigid part that has a, a flexible component in it uh, you know, that, that allows it to bend, or things like that. Um, we've done parts that have integrated seals already printed in them. That is so cool. You yeah. Know, it's an integrated seal. So like an like a O-ring kind of seal that's just in the part yep. itself out of the printer. Yeah, that's, that's just so cool. Yeah, you know, when I see your parts and I've seen your samples and I've talked, as I said, to at least two people who love your parts and and that detail. I've seen the fine detail you print and the range of material in one part is amazing. Like it, you, you, it's it's not just it, it feels even more profound than just two materials or something. It's like almost like a continuum or something. It feels to me anyway. Yeah, and I mean, so we, cool. We can do a lot of stuff like you know using other software as well. We primarily use NCOP for doing our latticing um, where you can vary things. So you can have a, a lattice that is stiffer on one end and softer on the other um, or has, has different gradients in it as well. Um, I mean, the, the yeah. feature size that we're printing right now is 
you know, the small end is about 300 microns, both for like positive and negative features. Um, mm -hmm. Really challenging for uh, most other technologies. I mean, like an SLS printer is using 100 micron powder, so they they can't resolve features that small. Well, and how? Wait, wait. With 100 micron powder, you can't resolve features. How small are these features again? We're we're doing about 300 is our is our typical lower end for both like a positive feature, so oh. like a beam or wall, something like that, and oh. a negative feature, so a hole. So really fine features and. And those can be held across a really big part. Like you can make, like how big a part can you make? Our build plate is uh, about 490 by 240 by about 200 millimeters. Uh, all yeah. of those numbers have a little bit of fudge to them. Uh, so don't sure. quote me exactly. Sure. Uh, but uh, quite large parts or the other thing we can do is we can just do a very large number of small parts. Yeah, because we are using uh, wax as the support material, we can also just stack all the parts in Z. So you can print an entire build plate uh, in one shot rather than needing mm -hmm. to uh, print them one layer at a time. You said at the beginning, you talked about production parts, but then in your discussion of examples, you were talking about prototyping things like over molded. Is anyone yet producing products. And I know I'm not looking for anything confidential. Is there any product you can talk about that's being produced where it's not just a prototype of an over mold, but you're actually making the parts that would appear over molded, but you're making it on the Inkbit machine. Is that happening? Uh, not yet. We are currently okay. uh, working with some partners who are developing uh, a, a couple different parts that are designed from the beginning to be printed on the on the Inkbit machine. Yeah, uh, oh, that's that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really cool. And it's also sort of the very necessary thing. Um, like any other mm -hmm. manufacturing technology, our technology works best when you design the part around it. So uh -huh. there's, there's a lot of savings you can do um, that are otherwise difficult. If you, you know, we can consolidate a whole bunch of parts together because you don't have to assemble parts to get weird internal features, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can do a lot of integrated components. We can we can remove a lot of assembly. We can do more geometric freedom, uh, which is really important for like a manifold or something where normally you'd be drilling like 60 holes and then plugging 58 of them. Um, hmm. So, so hmm. that kind of stuff has been really attractive to some customers, uh, but in order to get the best out of our technology, um, you know, in, in, they need to design around it. Someone who is- Yeah, designed, great point. Like a, like a machine component, you are starting with the largest block of a large block of material and removing as little material as possible, which is the most expensive way to print a 3D printed part. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I learned I learned that my own printing. You know, you always instinctively seem to use more material than you need. That's my feeling until you really rethink the part. It's like, oh, I don't need that material, you know, because I can I don't need to worry about how many setups it takes or something. Well, very exciting, you know, really um, very exciting. Can I ask you? The magic you're making with Inkbit, how much of it is about the machine? How much of it is about the materials? How much of it is about software to the extent you can talk about it? Yeah, so um, all of the above. Um, okay. So the, the, the size and the accuracy of the machine um, and then the number of materials we can load onto it is sort of what enables large parts and the multi-material flexibility. So we could print up to three different build materials in addition to our support. Uh, in a single print. Uh, mm -hmm. So that that's really core to doing some of this multi-material stuff that customers find attractive. Uh, the materials themselves are all materials we have developed. Uh, we did not like some of the offerings of what traditional, uh, you know, uh, resin cured or UV cured materials look like. Um, so we developed our own chasing after certain properties, which is why we have, I mean, what's in my opinion, one of the best sets of uh, elastomer materials that you'll find on any 3D printer. Um, our properties mm -hmm. are, are really good just off the spec sheets compared to others and uh, the feel of them people love because a lot of these other um, tech, like the, the parts will come out kind of sticky or gummy. Uh, we definitely don't mm -hmm. have that problem. We don't have the viscoelasticity that you see with other parts. Let me go to the design of parts. I love what you said about you have to design not just for additive, for the but for the additive process that you have, right? Especially one like yours that opens the door to so many new kinds of parts. It's, it's very exciting to me. Um, I uh, can you tell us about your design tools now? Yeah. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna soapbox a little here, but uh, I think uh, the additive manufacturing industry, uh, one of the reasons it's been struggling to really break into full manufacturing for a long time, um, is it's very reliant on other technologies. Um, it's it's the machine, it's the materials, but it's also the software. Uh, mm -hmm. And basically, none of these additive companies are making software that helps you design parts for additive. Uh, and if you really want to get the most out of it, you have to use tools that are uh, traditionally uh, most engineers don't use and are not really available to them and are very expensive. Um, so, you know, like these uh, iter generative design programs where you tell it, I want to maintain these features, remove all the material I don't need. Right? That kind of stuff is really powerful and gives really good uh, cost savings and benefits for added parts, but it's not accessible to most people. Um, so we we do end top stuff on our end, um, and we actually sometimes even do it for customers. You know, we have some application fee uh, where someone will uh, make some of the modifications that customers are looking for. Um, but yeah, I mean, we it's it's a very different thought process. Um, and even when you start to to CAD things for additive manufacturing, you start to realize that most CAD is sort of built around even a traditional idea of um, subtractive manufacturing, typically, mm -hmm. uh, and even like the way that you're you're used to it. Right? I begin almost every CAD, uh, or at least one point I did by, you know, extruding like a cylinder or a block and then removing material from it. And like the, the CAD process was much the same as the machining process. Mm -hmm. And that sort of approach works really well when you're trying to optimize for machining. Uh, but now I do a lot more free form work. Um, you know, I, I do a lot more uh, lofts and, and sweeps and stuff like that, uh, that are traditionally very hard to do. Um, I can be a lot more, you know, uh, I've done a lot of fluidic components where there are now these lofts and sweeps that, that move fluid from one place to another instead of a bunch of cross drilled yeah. holes, uh, which I've also had to design here. Um, and and uh, yeah, so, so I, I also developed some feature scripts um, that are uh, public. Uh, so if you look me up on, on Onshape, uh, I think you'll be able to find them. Um, and so like one of them was, uh, threads, right? Because we can print mm -hmm. threads in our parts. So that's one more operation. It's one more set of parts you don't need. Um, another one, uh, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of interest in, in printing ceiling components. So there's an O-ring mm -hmm. groove and, uh, mm -hmm. right now it's just a dovetail because dovetails are hard to machine, but they're really good at keeping your O-ring from falling out and we don't have the yeah. problem. <laughs> that see, that is such a cool note there i'm going to underscore it for our listeners you know so what you're saying is that a traditional o-ring would be around you know round cross section seated and you're making a dovetail shaped o-ring we're making a dovetail you, shaped groove groove yes yeah. yes that you wouldn't be able to make be impractical to manufacture i assume and yeah it's it's a other thing that's, processes it's a thing that's avoided because it's uh, just annoyingly expensive to machine that way, right? So yeah. most O-ring grooves are, you know, have a rectangular cross section, um, just yeah. because it's it's cheap and it's easy. Uh, but you yeah. know, we have we yeah. have that freeform. Uh, you can print grooves that uh, aren't round and and have significantly different shapes. Uh, and it'll it is so cool. And and you're not just saying you can do it. Like anyone could imagine, you know, doing that in traditional CAD would take some work. But you've made uh, feature script, that's Onshape's unique language for describing the modeling features like extrude, fillet, shell are built into Onshape and you can add your own like Andre's feature, features that um, are are written in the native language of Onshape features. And that's what feature script is. So you have your own feature. So in one step, you can create the, the these kind of uh, grooves that would for ceiling that would be uh, instead of having to manually do the work and then maybe not get it right um a user of your feature script can get your best thinking and easily make that groove just right is that right yeah and we yeah. we do this with uh some other things too um i also have a feature script for lure lock connections um so the standard of what's on like a syringe um oh and... see i don't even know what a lure lock is yeah so it's L is that l-u-e-r yes lure lock okay yeah. Um, so you said on a syringe. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that standard connection that that uh, syringe will connect to a fitting or like a, uh -huh. a needle or something. Um, 
uh -huh. so it's useful for doing a lot of small uh, fluidic stuff that we do. Um, and there's obviously yeah. interest in prototyping stuff for like biomanufacturing applications. So with your custom feature for that, it will feel as if it's built into the CAD system. It's that reliable and yeah. that robust. You and, click on the feature, and... you click on the point you want to add it to, and bam, it's there. Wonderful. Well, we're we're sure happy to hear that. And let me ask you, what is your sense if you look out? Um, let me turn to latticing and implicit geometry, because you're you're like the like you said at the beginning, you're one of the few systems that can really easily make these lattices. Of course, I've seen demo parts from other systems with the lattices, but they're tricky. And you're saying I've seen the inkbit ones are amazing. What what do you think? Look out five years, ten years. Do you think we're going to see a lot of use of lattice commonly in production parts? Like we'll just buy a product at the store and take it apart to be lattice. Is is that coming to our world? That's an excellent question. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. Uh, there's some applications where it makes a lot of sense. Um, and top, you know, has uh, lattices that are very specifically. Um, trying to uh, optimize for like heat exchangers and things like that. Um, that's a, a big use. Um, we can print, you know, one material that feels like a range of soft uh, hardnesses uh, based on how much we're, how dense we're making the lattice. Uh, that kind of stuff adds a lot of flexibility. And so we're kind of hoping that for, you know, not just prototyping, but like short production runs. Uh, it just makes more sense to print it than to get the mold to figure out the right hardness of material and, and stock mm -hmm. 30 different materials of, of different hardnesses. Uh, it's that flexibility and that very simplified supply chain and manufacturing uh, that we can offer. Is there anything you'd say to, you know, as someone who's not just providing tools to a product developer, but you're a product developer yourself, what, can, you know, do you have some some things that you'd say, here's, ideas you have on how to be more innovative, creative, productive, that you'd pass along to the product developers who are listening? Yeah, um, so I have worked in additive before. Um, I worked on uh, CNC machine tools. I've worked at a medical device company uh, doing injection molding. Um, That's right, you worked at Haas, right? I just yes. want to call that out because it's not just any CNC machine tool. I mean, Haas is like so popular, at least here in the United States, and I think excellent reputation. So that's pretty cool. That you, have to, you know, you worked at Haas because I see those machines. I was just talking to a Haas user yesterday, someone who machines on Haas. But anyway, go go on, please. Yeah, you were saying. Yeah, um, I think that that breadth of experience <clears throat> and that variety, um, even if you were trying to specialize in a particular field. Um, you just get exposed to a lot of lines of thinking that are just radically different than what you might be used to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get to borrow uh, some of those lines of thinking uh, and apply them in a place that they're not normally used. Uh, and I think that that's been very helpful for me. Uh, it's not just like I see a particular way of solving a problem and then I'm going to use it in my design here, but even the thought process of it. Uh, it's, you take it one step back and you're like, how do I apply that same thought process over here? Mm -hmm. um, that is a great way to um, to kind of wrap wrap up with the, it's the whole spirit of the podcast is, you know, you want to hear about uh, how other people think to help you in your product development. So I want to thank you on behalf of all our listeners for joining us today, Andre. And I love your point about learning and thinking about your own experiences and getting out there and seeing others. So thank you so much, Andre, for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure. You know, and thank you for what you're doing at Inkbet. And to our listeners and viewers, thank you all for tuning in. Remember, you can learn more about Inkbet at inkbit3d.com. You can talk to them. Uh, they're, they're a consultative company. They'll talk to you about your needs and what they can do for you. Once again, Andre, thank you. Uh, that's it for today. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.